essentially take some of that logic, move it into a version API like everything else uh, within the Kubernetes project and um, uh, make, make your life a little bit easier. So um, if anybody's ever been out and they've had like uh, a kubectl utility version that's different from their Kubernetes version on their cluster, you can run into all kinds of different weird edge cases there um, and trying to straddle and make sure that you're taking care of like different API version changes since those API versions are stored on the client side. Um, this just moves it all to the server side and will make it a little bit easier and will be the start of um, uh, a much more robust and consistent experience between versions um, as a project moves along. Uh, and then sidecar containers. So I think most folks that have been working in the Kubernetes space for a while at some point in time have probably deployed a second container or a third or fourth or fifth container to their pods um, and called it a sidecar. Um, whether that's uh, a Envoy sidecar as part of something like Istio or it's an ETL sidecar to accept API calls in one format and translate them to another format. Um, those didn't really have any meaning other than it's just another container in your pod. Uh, with Kubernetes 1.18, there'll be new functionality that will make sidecars an official kind of first class citizen um, where they'll have a special meaning. So if you have a sidecar that's responsible for capturing all of your network traffic going into your pod, and your pod gets a shutdown notice, you wanna make sure that things, your containers within that pod shut down in the correct order to make sure you don't still have streaming connections coming in um, when your application container is already down. Um, another thing here is the CF, CNCF released their annual report. This is kind of information collected from several different sources throughout the year, uh, KubeCon polls that they send out and different things of that nature. This is a really interesting read, gives you kind of a good view over what the overall community is, um, adoption of certain features and stuff like that, overall numbers from conference attendance to, um, you know, usage of CNCF landscape projects and things of that nature. Um, if you're familiar with like Gartner reports and stuff like that, this is the Gartner report for CNCF for the most part. Um, another interesting news, if you're an Amazon EKS user, uh, the Amazon dropped the price for EKS here. Um, thought that was interesting enough to make it a call out since it was literally having it. Um, um, another interesting thing here was pod security policy deprecation discussion. Um, so not officially deprecated, but uh, the discussion is leading in the direction that it will be deprecated in favor of a different solution that is yet to be known. Uh, so there's a lot of talk around potentially using the OPA gatekeeper project, uh, which is uh, open policy agent gatekeeper project. Uh, Microsoft's a big part of building that out, which essentially allows you to define policies similar to uh, the functionality you get with pod security policies as um, within the rego language that OPA uses and defines those as CRDs within your cluster. Um, so there's a couple other ideas that people are floating around with that, but um, if you're looking at pod security policies, probably good to kind of follow this thread and see where it takes. Um, the Kubernetes project announced a bug bounty program. Uh, I won't go into all the details, the link's up here. Hopefully everybody's semi-familiar with what a bug bounty program is, but. Um, if you want to go out and search for bugs within the Kubernetes code paste, they'll, they'll give you a little bit of money if you find them. <laughs> um, and then patch release updates. Uh, we've seen a couple different releases this month so far. Um, these are patch releases. So this was just 1.17 dot something, uh, 1.16 dot something, 1.15 dot something. Another important thing to note here is if you're running Kubernetes 1.14 or before, um, those are no longer supported officially by the community. Um, and that is it. So, um, as part of this, we want to try to keep this going, uh, for each monthly meetup. Um, if you like it, let us know. If you don't like it, let us know. Um, and again, if you have something that you want to be included in the, um, announcements in future meetups, feel free to go out on GitHub and open up an issue. Um, with all that being said, I'd like to welcome uh, Christian Posta from Solo.io, who's going to talk to us about Service Mesh. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Thank you.
All right, so let's get started. Do I need to use a microphone or will, they, will I be all right? Oh, that's right, we got your live stream. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll use the mic. All right. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming out. Uh, you all probably worked all day and now you're going to come listen to me for an hour and a half. I very much appreciate that. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, and I work for a company that's based out of Boston. And we do a lot in this Kubernetes uh, application networking space around service mesh and um, gateways and that kind of stuff. And what I'm hoping to do with the conversation today is there's a lot of confusion in this space. There's a lot of different technologies that are popping up in this space. Um, there's some overlap in uh, certain deployments and, and architectures with, with these technologies. What I'm hoping is to bring a little clarity, start a discussion, and also show what what you should look forward to. The, the, the space is moving very quickly. So I got a lot of content. I will, uh, I will go until I see on your faces that you can't take anymore. Uh, but please do ask questions. For those of you that, that ask questions, I have, uh, I have some swag here. I've got some shirts that I'll be able to, to hand out. All right, so my name is Christian. I work at a company called solo.io. We build um, tools on top of Envoy proxy and on top of service mesh and uh, we help our customers be successful with these technologies. These technologies are complicated. Um, they're not always the right answer for the, for the problem you, you have, but we try to educate and we try to help people be successful with that. Now I've been involved with um, building distributed systems and open source and, and so on for quite a while, over 10 years. Um, I, a lot of the stuff that I'll be talking about tonight I blog heavily about this. So if you go to my blog, you, you can, there's, there's a lot more detail than what I'm going to be able to show today in a, in a half an hour. I, uh, I've written a couple books, one on microservices. Uh, I wrote a book on Istio already. I'm writing another one just because I love it so much uh, and I like pain. Um, but we are, we are raffling off three digital copy, copies to the early access release of Istio in Action, which is the one that I'm working on right now. And I think if I mean, we had the link in the, in the meetup notes and I'm, I'm putting it up there. So if you go in there, fill it out. I think um, Betty, who's uh, our, our marketing person, she'll, she'll reach out, I think by tomorrow with, uh, with the winners. What you can expect out of the flow for this talk, we're gonna do a little level setting. I'm assuming that all the folks in here are different varying levels. Some people might be using this technology. Some people might not have heard of it. So we'll do a little level setting and understand why we might even be looking at this technology. Then we're going to start to go through some of the, the challenges that people face when they start going down this path of microservices and cloud native application development and so on. We'll start looking at some of the, the patterns that, um, that they try to solve. And then we'll start looking at the specific technologies. We'll look at Envoy, we'll look at some of the service mesh stuff. We're going to look at um, API gateways. And what I'm hoping to do, you can tell me at the end whether I'm successful, what I'm hoping to do is kind of call out where the confusion is in the API gateway versus service mesh space and help understand where the overlap is, where the complementary parts are when you use one or the other or not or neither, right? Um, and then we'll, 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 tr we'll try to bring it all together with a little bit more advanced topics. Uh, when you get to multi-cluster service mesh and all this stuff, it gets pretty complicated. And then we'll, we'll end with, uh, with some of the new stuff that's coming up on the horizon. So hopefully that's good. Um, I went through some of my old slides and I saw this slide I was using like four or five years ago. It's kind of a stupid slide, but um, I'm just curious how many people are doing or, or, or plan to do for some definition of microservices, uh, microservices. Okay, all right. How many folks are using or plan to use Kubernetes? Okay, about the same, same number. Um, now Kubernetes is awesome. I've been involved with Kubernetes since before 1.0. 
And Kubernetes is a, you know, solved a, a massive problem for us, which was how do we take workloads, scale them out across a lot of different machines and do that consistently and do that in a way that is independent of what the application really is, right? Because with Kubernetes running in containers, you can start and stop them and scale them and help check them all with a very uniform way of doing that. Um, building applications on top of Kubernetes, like microservices and all of these, these com complex distributed systems, forces us to rethink the way we build our applications. Before that, when we were deploying to more static environments, we, we could assume the network will always be there, the databases will never go down, and we kind of ingrained that into our applications until the database did go down and the network did go down. You know, we, you ended up with, uh, with, with some problems there. But with, with Kubernetes and these cloud-based platforms where applications are, are scaling up, scaling down, becoming unhealthy, getting, getting restarted, um, you know, you have to build the application know, knowing that the network will fail the applications may not be there. The topology at runtime will probably change and you can't predict it, All right? So that's a, it's a, it's a new, it's a, it's a powerful way to aut automate deployments, build CI CD and all this stuff, but your applications, when you start building your applications, they have to fundamentally be built to live in this environment. It's very difficult to lift and shift existing uh, applications that were not built for this environment and, and be successful. Now, Kubernetes and other automating, automation tools have paved the way for improving your, um, you know, the number of deployments that you can do, the, the, the deployment lead time, and so on. So this is a, a chart from the State of the DevOps report from a couple years back, but the trends are the same. We're able to improve the, um, the ability to do lots and lots of releases and reduce the lead time to change through some of the automation, maybe adopting Kubernetes, maybe adopting the CI CD platforms and so on. But one thing that this chart shows is that although we're able to mechanically go faster, we are, we're, uh, we're increasing the window on our safety uh, met metrics on things like mean time to recovery, becoming difficult to figure out exactly why things go wrong or the number of, of uh, incidents or, or um, uh, bad deployments that we're doing, bugs that we're introducing. All right, so that window is growing while we're able to go faster. We're, in, in, we're uh, increasing our, or lowering our safety um, when we start making deployments. And so for the rest of the talk, what we're gonna look at is this idea of, all right, Kubernetes is great for doing deployments, automation and so on, but what happens above that? When you deploy the applications, they need to talk with each other. When they talk with each other, you know, as the topology is changing, they need to solve for certain problems that, that, that arise in this environment. And what we'll see is that because of this ephemeral cloud compute you know, platform, because of these cloud networks, that service A talking to service B or service A talking to a message queue or a cache isn't as straightforward as it once was. That a lot of complexity creeps up into and be in between these, these cloud services. So some of the challenges that, you know, as an application developer, when you're building to live in this environment that you need to solve include things like service discovery. When you're A talking to B, how do, how do you know where B is if it's being scaled up and scaled down or becoming healthy or unhealthy, right? So you need some dynamic way of finding these services at runtime. You need to be able to load balance. And uh, if services are taking too long, you need to be able to time out and retry. If things are misbehaving past a certain point, you need to be able to implement circuit breaking uh, or deadlines. Um, things like controlling the traffic. So if you're making new deployments, can you control the traffic if that new deployment misbehaves? Or can you start to drip traffic over into the new deployment to lower the, the blast radius of, of, of changes that might impact the, the system negatively? All right, being able to do fault injection and uh, health checking and collecting telemetry about what's happening on the network at runtime, all these services are interacting with each other. Um, these, these are all kind of fundamental 
patterns or, or um, capabilities that we need to build into our applications. Now, talking over the network isn't all that new, right? And we've, we've been doing that since client server computing for a while. Um, the, 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 the issue comes when we start um, going from building big deployed, uh, big monolithic applications and deploying them in static environments to much smaller services, much smaller deployments, deploying a lot faster on ephemeral infrastructure. In the past, we could just say, stick a thing in the middle, stick EAI, message queues, ESBs, even API management, stick that in the middle. That will handle a lot of this type of communication, these types of challenges. This doesn't work very well in, in, the, in, in a cloud environment where things are coming and going in and very dynamic. That's the, that's the main reason, but another non-technological reason is the way we built workflows around that, that technology. We would say, oh, I don't know, this thing's really big and complicated. Let's build an entire team around it to support it. Let's build walls around it, ticketing systems and get workflows and, and kind of centralize our workflows around these environments. This, is, this just happens to be a quote from the, um, uh, Donald Ferguson, who built WebSphere, who's kind of saying exactly that. He built this, this modern middleware at the time, but he did it in such a way that it forced the workflows to go through these centralized teams, which slowed things down. Cloud environments, you know, the Netflixes and Amazons and Twitters and so on, they, they, didn't, they didn't go down that path. They said, we're going to implement these different pieces of functionality, but we're going to do it in our application uh, code, we're gonna, and you know, so for example, Netflix open sourced a lot of the, the frameworks and libraries that they use to implement circuit breaking and telemetry collection and edge routing and uh, load balancing and so on. But the practicalities of that in an enterprise today where you've got N number of different programming languages, right? So maybe you're using Java and Go and Python and Ruby or whatever. Um, getting all of those application frameworks and languages to implement timeout, retry, circuit breaking, distributed tracing, telemetry collection, deadlines, all these things exactly consistent across all the languages and all the frameworks becomes operationally pretty difficult. And then if in, even if you were able to get the implementation correct and consistent across all the languages, now if you find bugs and you have to make changes to it, do you do it in all of them? And how do you roll that out across the different languages and so on? That, the, the overhead of that uh, becomes uh, pretty tremendous. So we need to solve these problems. They're not optional. If you're going to deploy in a Kubernetes or cloud-based environment, we need, we, need to, we need to solve these problems. Now, stepping back a little bit and kind of understanding the, the bigger picture. All right, what, what does this actually look like when you deploy this? When you deploy applications, for example, in Kubernetes, I'm going to continue to use Kubernetes, but it, it, I'm using that as, as, a, um, you know, as an example of any cloud platform. So some of the patterns that we might run into. First, we need to get traffic into our services, or sorry, into our cluster and routed to our various services, right? Kind of a simplistic use case, but we need to be able to, to do that. Now, if services are coming and going and, and scaling and auto-scaling, coming unhealthy and so on, we need to be able to route and work around that. All right, so we need to get traffic into the, into the microservices. We probably, in most enterprises that I've seen that are adopting Kubernetes, also have other vintages of their deployments, right? So there's, they're deployed in VMs, they're deployed in Cloud Foundry, they're deployed um, you know, on physical hardware, in various vintages of, of software that need to come along and be part of any of the solutions that do get built on Kubernetes. So not only do we need to get traffic into our cluster, we need to get traffic into the cluster and unify that across our various deployment footprints. There are, there are use cases where maybe you're following domain-driven design or you know, your application footprint for your architecture is quite big where it makes sense to divide them up into different boundaries, different domains. And you need to expose the, the, the functionality of that domain out to the partners, out to the rest of the uh, architecture in a way that conceals or hides the implementation details of you know, that, that boundary. 
right? So you might need to uh, control access and, and provide decoupling within the application architecture as well. And then when services are talking with each other or to each other within the cluster, we still need to solve these problems, right? Timeout, retry, circuit breaking, distributed tracing, and so on. We need to be able to understand what's happening as the traffic gets into the cluster, as well as what happens to it from there. And when the applications start to talk with each other. So these problems exist as traffic's coming in, as well as the communication that's happening in the cluster and, and, and between the services. And then the last pattern that I'll point out is that a single cluster, a single Kubernetes cluster, for example, or a single deployment target is fairly trivial. What you'll end up with is multiple different clusters with different application architectures deployed in them, maybe with VMs and physical and functions of service and so on around it. And all of these things are going to need to, to communicate with each other. And again, these problems need to be solved. Um, so for look, all, these, all these different patterns have nuance to them and they have um, some differences between them, but they have some similarities. And so what we're gonna look at is just like with Kubernetes and containers and Docker and so on originally, that where they were able to take these cross-cutting concerns of packaging and deployment and scaling and health checking and so on and implement them in a consistent and unified way for any application, we're gonna look at some of the technology that's enabling us to be able to do the same thing for this application networking layer. Are there any questions so far? That's kind of the, right? That's the, that's the lay of the land, that's where we are. If you're gonna go down microservices, adopt this technology, this is, this is where you'll find yourself. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. You don't sound very ignorant. <laughs> That's a good question. Let, let me come back to that. I'll, I'll try to show that, okay? <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay. What's that? Oh, uh, medium, large, or XL? Oh, large. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, do you want my sweatshirt? <laughs> Are you cold? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So again, like I said, Kubernetes is awesome, great for deployments, great for scaling workloads. Let's look at the technology that's underpinning the ability to solve the problems that we just discussed in the same way. And how many people have heard of Envoy, Envoy Proxy? Oh, nice. All right. <laughs> I can end the talk here then. <laughs> Um, how many people are using Envoy or some derivative of a platform that uses Envoy? Okay, awesome. So in my mind, Envoy provides that underpinning to be able to solve some of these application networking challenges in a consistent way, regardless of the application language or framework that you're using. Now, we just, you know, coming back to this slide, this one, this one, or even the previous ones, these various deployment patterns or interaction patterns can get pretty complicated. So let's, let's you know, go through, let's look at what Envoy is and then look at um, some of those, I guess, expressions of deploying Envoy for solving these different challenges. Look at some of the workflows, look at some of the roles that Envoy can play to adequately solve these problems. So Envoy at its core is, well, first of all, it's an open source project. It's at the CNCF. It was one of the first two, three something projects at the CNCF to graduate to the top level, which is where Kubernetes is. Um, originally came out of uh, Lyft, a ride sharing company, and was purpose built to live in this cloud dynamic environment to help solve some of these challenges. So Envoy implements, so it's a proxy. So that's the first thing I wanna say. It's a proxy, which means traffic, application traffic will travel through it 
it will make some decisions about it, and then it will proxy and forward the, the traffic along. Right? So at its simplest, it's, it's a proxy. Envoy is capable of understanding application layer protocols. So HTTP, gRPC, WebSockets, you know, now Kafka and so on. So there's, there's, there's a, a large number of uh, filters that enable Envoy to understand the application layer. And it's able to do things like circuit breaking and timeouts and retries and request routing. It gathers a wealth of an incredible amount of telemetry about the failures, the latency, the people who are calling, the, you know, the various cluster backends that, um, you know, how they're behaving, how the load balancing is behaving, retry counts, and all this stuff. Um, and is, like I said, is, is um, it doesn't matter what the application is. It doesn't matter how you've written your application. If it's talking over the network, which is what we're, we're talking about here, is net application networking. If it's talking over the network, Envoy can provide some pretty powerful functionality that you need to solve one way or the other, right? In one particular scenario, this is not, this doesn't mean Envoy is constricted to this particular deployment, but this is kind of how it came out of Lyft, which was Envoy was deployed next to an application. And in, in Lyft, for example, it was deployed on AWS and VMs. Um, what it, Envoy was deployed next to the applications and the applications when they talked out over the network would talk through this proxy because you so you can kind of think of it as a forwarding proxy you probably heard of reverse proxy this is a forwarding proxy if you wanted to talk out to another service or a message queue or a database or a cache it would first go through this proxy and the proxy could apply things like retries and circuit breaking gather telemetry distributed tracing and so on. So it, it ends up doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but it lives outside of the application. So again, it doesn't matter what was used to write the, the application. Now, this idea of a proxy is not new. You may have heard <laughs> there are other proxies, HA proxy, Nginx, and, and so on. Um, but here's a why Envoy, if, if you've not come across that, you know. So technology gets popular and people start adopting it and so on, but there are some intrinsic real uh, reasons, I think, why. So first of all, Envoy is written in, in C++. Now there are other proxies that are written in garbage collected languages. Now the original authors of Envoy decided to use C++ because what they found, especially he, he came from Twitter, Matt Klein came from Twitter, and they built all of their networking, uh, um, networking stuff in, in Java. And what they found was that high load and um, you know, at the edge and some of these very important parts of the architecture that the garbage collector would just start taking garbage collecting events at some point. And then, you know, you get all these, these weird hard to track and hard to predict latencies, uh, tail latencies. So he built in C++ to kind of eliminate that and make it as deterministic as possible. Um, it was built from the ground up to live in this highly dynamic environment. And one of the biggest things that shows that is that Envoy is dynamically configurable. So Envoy reaches out to an API and pulls down its configuration and it can change its configuration on the fly without having to write files to the disk, without having to hot reload the process or any of this stuff. It changes it internally and, and can react. So one of the things I said is that, you know, these, these uh, uh, cloud platforms where services are coming and going, you need to be able to do service discovery and load balancing and so on, Envoy can very quickly adapt to those changes. Uh, it has a large, diverse and very vibrant community right now. Um, Google, you know, uses it internally, eBay and Verizon, obviously Lyft and, you know, the, go to the website, there's, there's tons and tons of uh, people who are using it and contributing to it. So in many ways, the way, well, the way Kubernetes became successful because of its community and its open source, um, we're seeing the same thing with, with Envoy. Uh, like I said, it has many L7 filters out of the box so it can understand your application level protocol and, and, and bring value uh, regardless of what your architecture looks like. Uh, incredible amount of telemetry. We'll start, we'll poke around a little bit at that. Um, and very versatile deployment options, right? So I started going through some of the patterns where we, where we might see 
um, traffic coming into our cluster and uh, domain boundaries and service to service communication, multi-cluster and so on. Uh, Envoy is very versatile in how we can deploy it. Now, I'm gonna jump in, I think, I think I'm doing okay on time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do a very quick, quick demo of Envoy. Now this is very, very basic. If you haven't seen Envoy, then um, you get a little, just very uh, basic taste for it here. First thing we're gonna do is set up a sample service, HTTP bin, which just, you can call it slash headers and slash status 500 and so on, and it'll return headers or it'll return, a, uh, you can get it to return failures and so on. So we'll, we'll start that service and then we'll try to run it. Several of these are running in Docker containers. We run it, we try to call it, everything looks fine. Now we're gonna try to uh, run Envoy. And so what we did here was we ran Envoy with uh, slash or dash dash help. By the way, this is a live demo. I'm having the computer do the typing. It's not a video. <laughs> Things could go, could go wrong. Um, I'm just not very good at, at typing up in front of a bunch of people. Uh, but we can see here, we ran Envoy. It's a, it's a, it's a simple process. Uh, we can see some of the documentation around it. Now, if we, if we try to run it, Directly, can you all see that? Is it big enough? Let me make it a little bit. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Right, we tried to run it, and it didn't work because it needs a configuration file. Now, moments ago, I just said the Envoy can be configured dynamically and through an API, and it can. But we're taking baby steps. This, we're looking at how we can configure it using. Uh, basic YAML files. So, for example, if we start Envoy with, actually, if I zoom in, can you? Oh, there we go. Um, we can we can start Envoy with a very very basic YAML file. We're just setting up where the admin endpoints will live, um, where the uh, where the port where the the listener will will listen. And then we're saying take all the traffic from any virtual uh, host or any domain that comes in and we're matching. So we can get pretty complicated with the matchers and, and so on. But we're just gonna forward off this traffic to the HTTP bin service or a cluster in this case. And then we, we, we've defined the cluster here. So very, fairly simple. Here's the port, here's the matching, send it off to this cluster. So if we run Envoy with this config file, on the bottom pane, you can see that it starts up fine. On the top pane, we are going to try the curl again, but to the proxy this time, and it should go through to the HTTP bin process. And what we see is Envoy has already done some helpful things to us. It's attached a request ID. Now, if we propagate this request ID through the rest of the system, we're able to correlate requests as they, as they flow through the system. Now, this is not full-blown distributed tracing, but it is a correlation ID that just because Envoy is in, in, the, in the middle there, um, it is able to add. Now, I mentioned the list of features and capabilities that Envoy has. We're going to look at, um, at being able to retry a request when a request fails, but like I said, timeouts, circuit breaking, telemetry collection, it can do security, TLS origination and termination, um, and, and, and just a whole bunch of, a really cool feature actually called request racing, where it sends two requests out, and the fastest one that comes back gets the, you know, gets the response. So it, it, it's got a lot of really good, um, uh, solves a lot of those hard distributed systems problems. So if we, if we restart Envoy on the bottom with, the, uh, oh, there it is. With a retry configuration, this basically says, oh, retry up to three times on 500s when we call the HTTP bin server, or well, rather when it matches, when it matches these, uh, these predicates. So on the top, we added retries. Now we're gonna call it again. We're gonna call HTTP bin service 
slash status slash 500. So we'll force the backend service to generate a 500. Um, we'll do that. Status 500. And now we're going to check the Envoy stats, of which there are a lot of stats. We should see that um, for the HTTP bin service or for the cluster that Envoy knows about, that it, it, it found three retries. Or so it did three retries and sent them to that service. So from an application standpoint, I didn't have to build that into my, my code and, and kind of pollute my application code and business logic with all of this application networking. Um, I've offloaded that to, to Envoy. Now let's just quickly clean that up. Okay. Now, that was a fairly simple demo where we saw Envoy kind of as a mediator proxy. I would call a service, but then Envoy was in the way and provided additional capabilities for, for the request. But Envoy is very light, um, is very performant, and the way we can deploy it is fairly versatile. So we kind of maybe looked at maybe this use case where we have Envoy kind of guarding a set of services that live in, in the back end, right? So at the edge, we have Envoy at the edge. Kind of a fairly understood pattern and, uh, and deployment. We could have also, we could also deploy Envoy as um, a shared gateway between services, either as a, uh, I mentioned a domain proxy where we're kind of fronting a group of services that are highly related that we don't want to expose directly. We could do it like that. Or we could say all of the services, all of service A, let's say, when, when a client wants to call, call service A, only service A, it'll go through service A's proxy. Right? And you can have that same thing for service B and service C and, and so on. Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yep. It'll help. It'll help propagate that. Now, in in reality, those types of headers and um, and especially when you get into distributed tracing, it's going to be the application's responsibility to help propagate those as well because um, the Envoy can't. Uh, definitively say that for a request that came in, this is exactly the request that, that went out. So the application will have to play some part in that as well. Yep, good question though. Right, so we have Envoy at the edge, Envoy as a shared proxy, and then if you've heard of service mesh, this is, this is the deployment approach where we deploy Envoy next to each instance of a service. So if you're running a Tomcat service is running next to Tomcat or Spring Boot or whatever, Node.js running next to the Node.js process. Um, and so this, now we start to get into interesting conversations, right? Because if we can have Envoy at these various, little, uh, these various areas of these various topologies, we can do some uh, pretty powerful things like guard the edge and have very fine grained control over how the traffic gets uh, routed in the cluster. And when calls are made, within the cluster, we can apply circuit breaking so we don't take down the entire, um, entire application architecture. All right, so we can build a lot of the smarts of, of application networking into the application without actually putting it into the application, run it in Envoy. Now, one thing I haven't, so I haven't called out explicitly uh, and what I alluded to when I said that Envoy can be configured dynamically. And we looked at a very simple example of how it can be done with files. Um, Envoy kind of expects a, um, a, an API that exposes the configuration that it, it should uh, consume. Right, so Envoy needs a way to control Envoy and provide that API. And that control plane component can be uh, you know, as fairly bespoke and simple as what they did at Lyft, which was they stood up a very simple Python API and um, put a bunch of salt scripts and so on to kind of gather what are the various endpoints that make up the services for service discovery uh, and configuring um, load balancing and so on 
through these various YAML uh, snippets that developers would have into full blown, uh, full full blown uh, control plane that uh, some of which we'll we'll take a look at. But I think the important he thing here is to kind of match and live um, in the same spirit of the the way Kubernetes um, defined its configuration. So if you go back and and look at the, the Kubernetes pods and services and um, deployments and so on, these were written in a very declarative format, right? YAML and JSON. And they, they stated the intent of what the system should look like. Uh, this is a pattern that's very common in, at, at Google and, and some of these other large cloud, um, cloud shops. But it's important that when we start to build a control plane, that we, st we, we follow that same model that Kubernetes laid out. Um, so we need a, we would we'd like a declarative API, ideally decentralized. Right, that's one of the main things I pointed out about some of the technology in the past and the assumptions in the past, that every, all the, the workflows were centralized and would go through the central team. If we could if we could decentralize parts of the workflow to the developers, to the SREs, to the folks who are in charge of the services, and kind of limit the necessary centralization. So we get kind of a balance of both. You can't centralize the whole thing, uh, at least not in a typical enterprise. Um, and if you're able to do that, then you build the foundation for being able to go faster, deploy, make deployments faster, make changes to your service faster, and so on. So this is going to be a central theme when we start looking at the control planes for, for Envoy and the various deployment mechanisms that we can, that we can do with, uh, with Envoy. Any questions so far? In the next section. Yes. So the question is, how are we associating the Envoy with the application? Now, if I if I restate it, are you are you saying in terms of maybe what the service mesh might be doing or that? Yeah. Yeah. And so the service mesh, and we haven't got into that section yet, but the service mesh has uh, controllers basically that can automatically associate in a particular Envoy instance with your application. And then at that point, you treat the Envoy and the application as one atomic unit, right? So if you're doing upgrades and, and all that stuff, you swap out the whole thing, right? But we can, we can uh, dive into that in a little bit more detail. Yes? Right, so the question is around how transparent the proxy should be or could be, wherein the application knows about the proxy or doesn't know about the, the proxy, and that will depend on the deployment model. So if we're talking about it at the edge, the call of the client is probably gonna know about the, where, to, where to contact the edge. If we're deep within the cluster and we're in a service mesh type deployment, then a majority of the service meshes implement a way to deploy the, the proxy transparently so the application doesn't know about it. It just uses DNS and then you know, the, the traffic is automatically through IP tables, magic and so on, or, or CNI or whatever, but to, to be able to uh, hide that from the application. So we'll look at a couple of different deployment models and then we can also go into more detail about that. Okay, I'm gonna go into API Gateway and Service Mesh. Some of the things that we looked at in terms of security, in terms of traffic routing, in terms of um, telemetry collection, observability, this kind of stuff, you might have existing infrastructure in your environment that does something like that, right? So API gateways, API management, these are the types of things that, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, that, that come up. Now, the, the first thing I wanna point out is when, when I talk about API gateway, I'm, you know, API management, I'm putting that off to the side for a second, because API management, how you onboard developers and how you manage the life cycle of an API and how you manage billing and all this stuff, that's important, but that isn't in scope of what I'm, I'm just talking about the application networking parts of the equation, right? So when I say API gateway, I'm, I'm talking about the API gateway pattern that if you've seen Chris Richardson's microservices book or any of the wikis that he's put out online, he's kind of um, crisply defined what this is. And what it is, 
is a single entry point into a group of microservices that hides the complexity of the implementation of the, each of those microservices and solves for uh, edge concerns like rate limiting and security and uh, authentication and authorization, this kind of stuff on behalf of those microservices. So the edge functionality, if we're familiar with this type of technology is, is, is important and, uh, and you know, it's familiar, right? But it's the, the fact that it's decoupling the application from its clients. That's the key here. That's what we're talking about here. So the application gateway, or sorry, the API gateway or the API gateway pattern as, as Chris Richardson defines it, abstracts the back end services. They might be implemented in gRPC. They might be implemented in an API that was built for internal, internal only use. But when you expose that externally and to the clients, you, you wanna control exactly how that looks. You wanna control exactly how the response messages look, even if they change in the backend services. Um, now, the way we start to kind of, kind of look at Envoy and its capability to be a quote unquote API gateway, we know it can do some of the transport level stuff, um, but it isn't a full blown API gateway. To, to be able to build this decoupling um, uh, mechanism, you need to have things like uh, uh, transformations, right? Envoy doesn't have that. You need to be able to expose things out at the edge um, following some of the not so nice security patterns that might have been implemented in enterprise, right? Uh, so you need to customize, maybe you need some custom tokenization or uh, token exchange protocols that an enterprise has. Maybe you're using OIDC. Um, these are things that Envoy doesn't have. Um, so that's why at, at Solo, we've, we're, we're in the business of trying to operationalize Envoy and help people get the most value out of this, why we built an open source project called Glue. Glue has a control plane that drives Envoy and it drives it to behave in this context of an API gateway where it lives at the edge, it solves the edge concerns. So authentication, authorization, rate limiting, um, all, of that, all that good stuff that you would expect also has the ability to uh, decouple the API that gets exposed from what's in the back end through the use of various transformations and so on. So Glue is a, uh, an API gateway. It runs in Kubernetes, but it doesn't have to run in Kubernetes. If you run it, run it outside of Kubernetes, we could do that too. Uh, run, just run it with, uh, with HashiCorp console or, or, or something like that. It can talk to Kubernetes services, it can talk to legacy services, and it can talk to function as a service. I think you asked that <laughs> and we'll, we'll look at that. Um, it has all of the enterprise-y kind of security features that you need, web application firewall and data loss protection and OIDC and API keys, all that stuff. Um, it's incredibly highly pluggable, just like Envoy is, right? So to be able to make changes to it, we've, we've built a plugin framework for that. So you can, you can add to it. So the control plane here, actually better uh, uh, diagram of the control plane where we're able to, build a, a very simple core control plane and plug in various uh, pieces of functionality. Like, can we discover from the Kubernetes registry? Yeah, just write a plugin for that. Can we discover from console? Yeah, why not? EC2, yeah, Vagrant, yeah, or, or uh, Terraform, yeah. So just write plugins and you know, you, you've made the control plane smarter and you're able to drive Envoy. Uh, same thing with secrets and, uh, and, and those types of credentials, um, as well as, you know, authentication and, and, and the security plugins. Now, Glue is very ex extensible, has all of these security features. What I like about it most, because I don't like talking about technology and replacing all the old technology with a new technology and just doing the same old thing again, right? I, 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 I want to be able to provide the opportunity for organizations to <laughs> Um, go faster through how they alter their workflows. Glue very purposely has a decentralized and declarative model for configuring Envoy. So in other words, the operations teams, the folks who need to control the domains and the security parameters and the rate limiting or whatever, let them own that part. The developers or the development teams or the SREs as part of the development teams, they can own the, um, the context-based based routing, the matching that happens to get the traffic to your service, the transformations that you need to do to get it to your service, and so on. And so the, the Glue API is 
built specifically for, for this. Let me show you a very, very quick demo. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna look at here is on the bottom pane, uh-oh, all right, that's all right. On the bottom pane, we're going to take a look at the components that make up the glue and, and, and the glue control plane. Um, we have a handful of things that are just kind of ancillary where we dump telemetry and we're able to observe telemetry and implement uh, rate limiting counters and so on. Uh, but the important parts are this component right here, which, ser which serves the API to Envoy and Envoy is called XDS. Um, and then the gateway proxy itself right here. So if we take a look at that, uh, uh, and take a look at what's running inside of that pod, we can see sure enough, there's Envoy, like we saw in the previous demo. We're passing it a very simplistic bootstrap config that basically says, hey, Envoy, go look at this API. Get all your configuration from this API. And that API is, is the glue control plane. All right, so now if I come over here, we also have a, a, a web UI for, for glue. If I refresh this, we can, we can see the health of the proxies. We can see the virtual APIs that we've defined on the proxy. In this case, we have a very simple one called default. We can see excuse me, the, the services that we've automatically just discovered. So the glue control plane can go out and automatically find things in a registry and a catalog and so on and present them to you. Um, we can also find services that, uh, so we can find the services themselves and we can also do an additional layer. We can look at and say, oh, this has swagger on this service. So this is an open API service or this is gRPC and exposes gRPC reflection. So we can go through and look at the various gRPC functions that get, ex get exposed. So for example, if we look at the pet, this pet store simple one right here, we can see that there are um, four, four different um, rest endpoints that we can hit. For this very simple service or application, we're gonna, we're gonna just show basic routing. So this, let's say this is a, your Java application is deployed and you wanna make changes to it. So what do you do? You start going down the, the strangler pattern, start building services around it. Maybe you want to build a service to extend the capabilities of, let's see, the find owner and veterinarians. Maybe we want to add another column to the veterinarians tab. Um, and so what we can do inside of Glue is, uh, uh, you know, through, through this UI, we can make changes to the routing tables and, and force traffic a certain way. Um, now, I want to point out that all of this stuff that happens behind the scenes is it's declarative YAML files, all right? So although you have a nice UI for some people who are happy with UIs, all of this stuff is just like Kubernetes and YAML files. You're able to declare the intent of, this, of the system and Glue implements controllers to go make it that way, all right? So you can plug this into your GitOps and to your um, development pipeline and allow the decentralization of the API and, and allow developers to get the, uh, the benefit of that. Um, now I'm running slightly low on time. Let me, so I show the UI. Let me show you, um, let me show you a different demo. Let me show you the route delegation or the decentralization part. Um, let me, let me get rid of that real quick and let's set this one up. Now what we're gonna do here is we're gonna show how to, um, decentralize the ownership of the API gateway or uh, the, uh, of Envoy in this case to separate teams and to developers and how we can centralize the parts that operators might care about or the platform teams might care about. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at what pods we have running. I have one very simple echo server. I'm gonna route all my traffic to their echo server. Just keep it very simple, right? Now, I told you that 
all of the the definitions for the um, for the glue control plane here are, are declarative, and in this case, it's YAML. All right, so we're going to take a look at this. What this is saying here is that we're going to define a virtual API that for a match on this particular path, uh, API slash check card slash check, so it's kind of finance oriented, but uh, we're going to route to, to a particular service. Fairly simple, right? Here's the predicate routed to this service. Kind of matches what we saw on the Envoy config. Now, I'm just routing everything to the Echo service, but you can see that I've defined a couple different APIs that we will expose to the outside the proxy, right? Now, if these were various different teams and we wanted to have like the loan status and the risk screen service, all these be microservice teams on their own service, you kind of have to coordinate and kind of centralize this configuration, which is what we, I mean, you, you might want, but you might not want. You might want to decentralize that. So let's apply this, uh, this configuration. Now, if I come here, um, I think we should get the URL here. If I come here and go to API, what was it? Risk screen slash check. We can see that we, we get to the echo service and, and that's fine. If I try any of the other ones, um, loan status, we should just get the same, same service, that's fine. But they are different, technically different APIs. So if we wanna decentralize this now, and we wanna give the risk screen service autonomy over how it matches on the traffic coming in, and the routing that it does, what we can do is put that into uh, the route table resource. All right, so we give this to the, to the risk screen folks. They include this as part of their application. When their application goes through CICD, this gets merged in, and then at runtime, the, uh, the proxy gets configured with, with, their, with their settings here. From the centralization standpoint, so if we look at this one, we go back to that virtual service that we saw previously. We have some uh, of, of, the, of the root of the, of the matching prefix, but then we're delegating, delegating. So we're delegating this off to the route tables that the developers will worry about. Now, on this particular resource, the virtual service resource, we can control things like the security parameters, TLS, which certificates we use, OIDC, rate limiting. Right? And these are things that you might not want to give to the development teams. If you do, then just give them the service. But if you want to centralize that, keep it yourself. Um, so let's deploy the, the route tables. So each individual service you could imagine has these, owns these configs, deploys them, and we'll deploy the virtual services that delegate to the, uh, to the various route tables. And of course, we should see, yep, indeed, everything still works. But if I am a central team and I want to add something like, let's say, um, uh, some external auth, right? I have some complicated security uh, uh, that I need to enable at the edge here, and I'm not going to let the service teams, the SRE, or, or that, that specific team own this functionality. I'll, as an operator, as a platform operator, I can put this into the virtual service without disturbing and having to contact the development teams, right? So we've lowered the friction that, uh, or eliminated in some cases, that uh, can occur and slow the deployments down. So if I go ahead and deploy that, yep, so it works, deploy that. None of the routing has changed. And now if I come back here and try to hit one of those services, I get uh, challenged to, to log in. On the developer side, if I want to add transformations, so here's, here's an example where in that uh, routing table, I want to add a transformation. Maybe I want to force the body to be a certain value or whatever. I, can, I have full ownership over that. And in the past, an API management, API gateway, one of the problems I have with that is that a lot of application logic and transformation logic was centralized into that, uh, that one team that owned it. So if you wanted to change it, you had to go coordinate with them. In this model that's decentralized, the application developers own it in the right spot and you know, they, they can deploy whenever they want ir irrespective of the centralized team. 
How are we all doing? Hello, Wake. <laughs> yes, questions over there. Great question. <laughs> the question was, knowing what I know about Istio, because I'm writing a book, I've been involved in the community there, and that I'm working for a company that builds and sells API gateways, it seems like there's a lot of overlap. You might want to use one or the other. It's competitive. Um, and I say, that's a great question. Let me continue and I'll get into how they're, because the, really what, I, like I said at the beginning, I want to clarify why they're different. That's exactly the question that, proved, that, that I've seen and heard that, you know, why don't just use one or the other? They seem exactly the same to me. And I, I would like to hopefully clarify that by the end. If you all are still awake, shall I keep going? <laughs> all right. Okay, so we just, uh, no, more, no more shirts. Yeah. Um, so Envoy supports HTTP 1, uh, 1, 1 1.1 and 2, uh, gRPC, Redis, MySQL, DynamoDB, Kafka, uh, and there might be a, a, a couple others. Um, but Envoy is built on a, so basically, basically it's a pipeline, right? And there's a, a specific spot in the pipeline where you can plug in your own filters. So you can write codecs for other uh, types of, um, of protocols and plug them in there. Now there's a challenge with that because Envoy is built uh, with C++, like I said, and when you build these filters, you have to uh, statically link them into the binary itself. Now if I, can, if I get to the end, if I have enough time to get to the end, I'll, I'll show you what, what we're doing to, to alleviate a lot of that pain. UDP I think is coming. Um, I don't think it's fully there yet. Yep. Yes. 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 Yep. So that's why I tried to jump to the UI a little bit and show you that we can, we can view things, we can configure things in the UI, but unlike, you know, previous generations of this type of technology where the UI would build some internal representation that was proprietary to that particular tool or some weird XML stuff, this generates CRDs if you're running in Kubernetes or it, it, it generates the declarative YAML. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So you have the UI is uh, available with the open source, I think in a read only mode, uh, but I'm trying to get, I'm pushing to have that a little bit more relaxed. <laughs> Yeah. And are, are you specifically going to dedicate to manage them or do you have some sort of centralized? Great question. So the question was, what's the latency overhead of some of these proxies, especially when you're taking multiple hops? And then the second part of it was, um, are you managing these proxies individually? Let's start with the second one first. Because in the original demo I showed, we logged in and we showed you we just passed the YAML file into and we were configuring it that way. Each proxy, so for example, in this, in this demo, we had the Envoy proxy listening or connected really to the glue control plane. And we could have had 10, 100,000 of those proxies. They all would have been listening to the glue control plane. They all would have been getting their configuration from glue. So they're all managed from a, uh, a, single, a single spot. <laughs> they're all managed, for, uh, managed from a single spot. Now that's in the, Edge API gateway use case. When we get into the service mesh stuff, which we're talking about right now, same sort of architecture. You have a control plane, central location from which you manage the configurations for all of the proxies. Does that answer your question? And the first one was latency. So Envoy by itself. So uh, like I said, there, there's no free lunch. You, there's going to be some overhead here. Uh, you have to compare it to um, either not doing it or doing it alternatively in, in the programming language of your choice. Um, the latency for Envoy by itself is about a millisecond, sub millisecond. 
Now, depending on the service mesh that you choose, uh, maybe Istio in the past has had uh, some pretty not impressive performance, more like 10 to 20 milliseconds overhead, which is not good. Not even, you can't, you can't run it like that. Um, but first of all, for Istio, they're improving these, these performance issues. There are very well-known bottlenecks in the architecture that um, in both recent release 1.4 and 1.5 will continue to alleviate. Now, when I, when I talk about Istio, especially around performance, I always say, you know, Kubernetes 1.1 was shit, right? Kubernetes 1.2 got better. Kubernetes 1.3 and 4 and so on got a lot better. Google for Kubernetes and, and for Istio too, because they have something similar inside of Google. Google literally has a crystal ball on what the APIs should look like, what the challenges they're gonna run into, what are the performance drawbacks and how to fix them. Now this stuff takes time in open source and I would expect, and, and we're seeing this with Istio, the, uh, these, these challenges to improve. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So we do validations of the uh, config. We do validations in terms of whether we're routing to an existing service that can be routed to. Um, and then in terms of uh, workflow and policies around who's allowed to write the policies and who's allowed to uh, change them and so on, uh, we, I think we have some integrations with uh, Open Policy Agent to allow you to, to manage you know, who's allowed to really do what with the uh, the various CRDs. And that kind of problem is, is a little bit independent of, of glue, but it, it does come up and, uh, and that's how we're, we're helping people with that. Yes? So with this deal, you have the use case of any mesh where you can uh, create the ERP application that decides that it's compatible with the device with an annotation in the How does it work with like the preparing an annotation pattern that the system is using? Or, or do you see the end business So glue in the demo that I was just showing and the use case that I was just showing is at an API gateway level, right? So we're not, there's not sidecars. It's running at the edge uh, or as a shared proxy. So I was showed earlier how Envoy is fairly versatile and how it can be deployed. Uh, we're looking at, at the edge or as a shared gateway scenario, not in a service mesh or individual, you know, sidecar proxy scenario. Does that make sense? All right, now, let me keep going. I'll get to the part where we combine the two and kind of explain the differences. Yes, yeah, hopefully. Okay, how many people are using a service mesh? Uh, I don't know if I asked that already. Couple, three, three, okay, all right. So continuing, so like I said, Envoy implements a lot of functionality that applications need when they're, when they're deploying into a cloud environment. We started looking at the edge. We started looking at the edge when traffic's coming in as an API gateway. How can we use Envoy to solve the challenge of routing, solve the challenge of some of the security concerns? And we looked at Glue, which was specially optimized to be an API gateway, so to kind of decouple the APIs at the edge. Now, what we're gonna look at is when traffic the cluster, and applications are talking to each other. How are we solving those problems for that use case? And, and that's where the service mesh comes in. The service mesh takes those Envoy proxies and deploys them alongside each application instance. And it has a control plane, so we can see here at the very top. It has a control plane, which also offers an API. So just like we saw Glue had CRDs for driving the behavior of the edge, the service mesh also has an API based on CRDs if you're running in Kubernetes that centralizes the configuration and distributes the configuration to the various proxies. Because you don't wanna, uh, we've run into people who are, who are doing this, it's very painful to try to manage the configuration of each and individual, each uh, proxy uh, itself. So in a service mesh setup, the proxy is co-deployed with the application. In a Kubernetes world, especially, 
This is kind of a native deployment pattern uh, with the Kubernetes pod. You can deploy two containers in a single pod and they get deployed atomically. So one container would be the application container. The other container would be the proxy itself. It'll be running next to the application. Now, the app, when it wants to talk outside, it wants to talk to another service or a database or a queue or whatever. Uh, things like uh, Istio, things like Linkerd, um, I believe AppMesh does, App Mesh does this also, where it will, it will in, it inject the proxy and then rewrite the IP tables rules so that the application traffic always goes through the proxy, right? So the application itself doesn't see, it doesn't know about the proxy. So if you inject the proxy and it starts doing all this stuff for you and then all of a sudden starts misbehaving, you can take the proxy out when the application doesn't know, right? Now some, some service meshes, you kind of do have to know that the proxy is there. So HashiCorp console service mesh, they follow a model where you bind everything to local host. So if you want to talk to the proxy or, want, or you want to talk to a service, you talk to local host and the proxy happens to be running there and captures that traffic and then does the routing for you. All right, so there's a couple different ways to do it. Now, as the traffic is flowing through the proxy, the proxy can do things like timeouts and retries and circuit breaking on behalf of the client, right? So in this case, the, the client, when it's making calls, becomes a lot smarter about the environment. It can do service discovery. It can find service B when it's trying to talk to it. It can do load balancing on the client side. Um, Envoy has a handful of different load balancing al algorithms out of the box. It can originate TLS. It can start capturing telemetry and originate distributed tracing. So the client becomes much more aware about the environment and applies these various pieces of functionality. So the application code doesn't, the, you know, the application developer doesn't have to kind of jam all this stuff into the, the code itself. And in this particular scenario, we take a look at a, uh, a case where the traffic is going from the app to the proxy running in Kubernetes, at least in the same pod. So it goes from pod to pod, but it goes through these proxies. It goes the proxy first on the app on the first side, and then on the, on the other side before it gets to the other application instance first goes through the proxy. All right, in this particular scenario, because the traffic is going through these two different control points, we can encrypt the traffic between the proxies, All right? So another role of the control plane could be to assert and assign identity and deliver certificates to the different proxies so that the transport can be automatically encrypted without the applications knowing about it. Now as a developer, and I'm a, I come from a developer background, that's huge. Screwing around with trust stores and key stores and cipher suites and all this stuff can be really painful. And then if you get it right, you go into IST and UAT and prod and then it's all, you have to redo it all again. Um, this, this greatly simplifies the operational aspects of, of, of achieving that. So a service mesh in general is speci scoped specifically to a particular application instance. It makes the application instances smarter and it allows you to implement things like the resiliency aspects, things I've mentioned, timeout, retry, circuit breaking, deadline, that kind of, kind of stuff, um, traffic control. So deep within your cluster, not just at the edge, but deep within your cluster, you can control traffic to let's say A calls B calls C, and then C needs to call D. Now we release a new version of D, and we wanna have only 1% of the traffic go to D from, from uh, service C. All right, so with these proxies deployed next to each application instance, we have very fine grained control deep within the cluster um, to be able to do uh, header-based routing and 1% uh, traffic splits and uh, you know, variable traffic splits, uh, traffic shadowing. Um, and so these are, these are fairly powerful things to have with, uh, deep within the mesh. We're all, also, each proxy can collect the telemetry at each particular application instance. We can see request rates, failure rates, circuit breaking events, retries, like we saw a little bit earlier. Um, and lastly, we can secure all of the communication 
in the mesh. When any service tries to talk to another service in the mesh, we can automatically get um, that traffic encrypted. The, the mesh also does uh, follow the Spiffy protocol. If any of you uh, have, have heard of Spiffy as an identity uh, specification for identifying workloads or assigning identity to workloads. Um, so we can give workload identity through the mesh to these individual services and write policies about which services are allowed to talk with which other ones based on those identities. In the past, identity was always assigned at like the network level and IP uh, addresses and subnets and so on. Now with the service mesh, with the side with the sidecar running in each instance, with its own assigned identity, we can have identity down to the workload instance and write policies about them. Now, the last thing I think I'll point out here about the service mesh is that all this functionality is great, but the important part about it is that it provides an API on top of your network traffic, a declarative API, just like we saw with Glue, just like we saw with Kubernetes, it defines this intention-based declarative API on top of all of your application network from the edge down into the cluster deep within the cluster. All right, and this is key. The ability to build automation on top of this, the ability to build things, on, other capabilities like, for example, canary deployments on top of this or chaos experimentation on top of this, debugging tools and so on. So these are things that at Solo, we're really interested in this. This is why we're interested in the service mesh, not because you know, it's another very complex technology that, that the enterprises are gonna adopt, it's because the stuff that it enables on top of it. So Istio is one particular implementation of a service mesh. Um, it, it, it's open source, backed by Google, IBM, Red Hat, VMware, Solo, and, um, and is also what I'm, what I'm writing, a, writing a book about right now. Now, I'm going to skip the Istio demo. Um, there's tons of those online. Let's try to bring this all together. Here's where I'm gonna either, I'll get it right, or you're gonna tell me, you just confused, confused me even more. <laughs> um, happy to have the, the feedback. So, there's no doubt confusion in this space. There's a lots of different service mesh technologies where you hear of Envoy and, and various uh, in API gateways, ingress gateways, all of the various uh, uh, points. And what I, what I wanna focus on is the workflows that you build and the roles that, that we see. So I said Envoy is the kind of the backbone Envoy can be very versatile and run in various different parts of your architecture to help solve problems where, where they exist. Now, there is overlap, because well, let's say the API Gateway and Istio, right? They're both built on Envoy. Obvious overlap. <laughs> All the capabilities of Envoy are overlap between the two different uh, implementations. So, the service mesh and the API gateway can use the same implementation. If you're using an API gateway that's not built on Envoy, you should. <laughs> um, but when you start to get to the edge, things get a little bit more complicated. There are things that you need to solve at the edge that the service mesh doesn't and likely won't solve. Service mesh is mostly focused on uh, east-west traffic. Now there are some uh, uh, service mesh vendors like Istio, for example, that do have a gateway out of the box. And they, they have something called the ingress gateway. And they built the ingress gateway for two main reasons. One, to let traffic into the cluster because back when Istio started, there wasn't really a good way. The, the ingress resource was not sufficient for how Istio wanted to allow traffic into the cluster. So they needed something a little bit more capable and when they got to, and currently are, at multi-cluster scenarios, they needed some way to get traffic into the, in the cluster and bridge across multiple clusters. So they built the in ingress gateway. But the ingress gateway is not an API gateway. And I tried to define that earlier to be very clear that the API gateway is decoupling the APIs that live in 
the, in the cluster. All right, so with the ECO ingress gateway, we can expose APIs as they are as, as, as HTTP endpoints, um, but we can't do things like transformations of the requests when they come in. If the gateway itself fails, what is the response that the gateway gives? We can't control that. Um, so the client is gonna see just some, whatever the gateway returns, right? So we wanna shield the clients from that. We want to be able to control, in some cases, the, the proxying. If the, if the proxy comes in, we might not want it to go through. We might want it to just dead end and return right away with a pre-configured known format, no, me no message, right? Uh, we might need to build additional security um, protocols around it. These are not things that the service mesh and specifically the SDO ingress gateway today supports. Um, and so for the role of API gateway, if you need that, if you don't, then you know, ignore it. Uh, but for the role of API gateway, you need something that implements the API gateway pattern. <laughs> um, now, so I listed here in this table, some of the um, feature level differences between the two, right? So we have overlap and we have, you know, this is, this is why the API gateway, uh, you know, complements the service mesh. But I think the two, the two really big points are the uh, API gateway is intended to abstract away the details of the implementation, right? So I'm gonna keep re reinforcing that. So that the client doesn't have to know. The client's dumb, right? The client just calls the endpoint, thinks it's an API, thinks it's an application, right? The client is incredibly simplified, doesn't care about the rest of the architecture. On the service mesh side, that's not the case. A client in a service mesh architecture is incredibly smart. The client knows a lot, everything about the application architecture because the mesh is providing it those details. What are the different endpoints? How do you do service discovery? When the application uh, topology changes, how do we do zone aware routing and load balance, right? So it knows everything. The, so the important, the important part is that the, the API gateway provides an abstraction. The service mesh says, here's the implementation details. Right? And depending on where you're trying to solve the problem in your application network, use one or the other, or both, if you need both, right? Um, now, so I guess here's a slide for how, how they're complementary, right? Because an API gateway doesn't obviate the need for service to service, solving those problems service to service, but you might not have a complex enough application architecture where you need a service mesh, right? Or the converse. Maybe you have a bunch of services that you want to expose exactly how they are to everyone. And then you don't need an API gateway. Are there any questions about that? <laughs> Did I make it more confusing? <laughs> All right. How are we on time? What time do we end? At what time? We end at 8.30? 10. <laughs> Somebody give me a beer if it's 10. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the la let me, I'm, I'm finishing up, I'm finishing up. Um, the last part that I wanna talk about is, so in, earlier in the slides, we looked at a couple of patterns where we said for, for application networking, traffic coming into Kubernetes, we need to solve at the edge. We might have domain boundaries we wanna draw. We have surface to service challenges that we need to solve. And then we have the multi-cluster, multi-deployment hybrid scenario where, where we need to solve that, right? Um, with, with Glue, we can solve the edge. We can solve um, the, the hybrid. You know, you have functions as a service, you have VMs and you have Kubernetes, you need to unify all of, all of those. Um, you can also use Glue as a domain gateway. And, we, and we, we have people, users that are doing that. We saw a service mesh for the service to service communication challenges. Now let's look at what things look like across multiple clusters or multiple deployments of maybe a, 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 a service mesh with you know, all of these problems solved, all right? So if you're gonna take a service mesh and it doesn't matter which one, you know, I'm, I've been involved in Istio, but Look at 
console service mesh, look at app mesh, especially if you're on AWS, you, you should got to look at app mesh. Uh, Linkerd is awesome also. Um, you know, the Kong folks have their thing and Mesh from the Trafic folks. And so there's lots lots of different service meshes. Take a look at them. Um, but when you actually start to solve this problem, for it to bring the value that you need, especially considering that the complexity that it introduces, you get more value out of the mesh, the more services you have within it. All right, so if you can, if you can talk to services, but they're only just in your cluster, then that's not gonna, that might not be as useful, All right? So for any non-trivial deployment of a service mesh or this type of technology, we're talking multiple clusters by default, All right? Now, Istio, console, and some of these mesh in Linkerd is building it now, technologies have the ability to do a multi-cluster deployment. It's just really, really complicated. <laughs> um, so for example, in Istio, you can set up two different control planes and then you can map the various services from one to the other. You can try to set up root, uh, common root CAs so that the certificates derive from the uh, same root and the intermediates and so forth. Um, and then you have to kind of plumb the the, the telemetry gathering, the Prometheus, you got to federate the Prometheuses and so on. Um, then you have to figure out exactly what the, uh, the routing rules would look like between each of the different meshes, figure out how to solve the distributed tracing, single pane of glass, and so on. So there's getting into a multi-cluster scenario of any particular service mesh, although the functionality might be there, the tools are there, it's not easy, right? And so what we are going to be this is, I guess I can probably talk about it. We're going to be open sourcing this pretty soon, <laughs> uh, within the next month. Uh, the ability to manage multiple clusters of, of Istio, right? So we're going to start off with that. Multiple clusters of Istio, we're going to significantly, we're working on, I'll show you a demo in a second, significantly simplify what it means to operate Istio in a non-trivial way across multiple clusters. Now, another use case that we're interested in is you start with Istio today or whatever, pick, you pick your mesh today, start with that. And then you go to AWS and you say, well, they just, what do they just cut the, the prices of the instances on AWS. I'm gonna move my workloads there. AWS has AWS app mesh, runs on uh, EKS, your own Kubernetes, EC2, ECS, Fargate, all of these, right? Might as well just use it. So you might find yourself in a situation where you're you know, incentivized to use a different mesh. Well, you already have one. Or um, you acquire a company that has another tech set of technology, right? That's, that's pretty reasonable. Or you're an enterprise and you have five of anything anyway. So the reality is you're gonna end up, th these enterprises are gonna end up in, the, in this scenario. So if we take the base case of Istio across, across multiple clusters is hard, how do we solve that? And now if we have these heterogeneous mesh implementations, how do we unify them? How do we bring them together? And how do we solve some of that, that realistic enterprise nastiness? So let me show you just a very, very, very quick demo. And then we can probably, probably get out of here. First thing we're gonna do is On the right. So the question was, is this part of the SMI spec? And the SMI spec is a um, kind of a unification of various service mesh APIs. So I, remember, I mentioned that the API, the service mesh, that declarative interface, that's, that's the holy grail because that's what enables the automation. That's what enables all the things on top of it. Um, and SMI is a community effort um, started by us actually back in 2018, in November, when we, when we open sourced a, uh, a project that was doing exactly this, but then picked up by Microsoft and other folks. And now it's a whole group of people to, uh, to unify that. And so the question was, is this what I'm about to show part of that story? And the answer is yes, because if we can have a unification of the configurations, vendor independent, 
um, then we can, you know, number one, provide some, some comfort to the folks who are saying, what the hell mesh do I pick? <laughs> um, we can write tooling and automation on top of the API, regardless of what implementation, which flavor we're using uh, and so on. But so, so the service mesh hub stuff is predicated on that, but the reality is we'll get into situations where one mesh will support one thing and the other thing won't and so on. We don't wanna provide the lowest common denominator. Um, and so what, what, we're, what we're doing is we're, we're supporting SMI, but we're also supporting the native meshes directly. Uh, so you can get the full benefit and full power of, uh, of each mesh. All right, so let me come over here super, super quick, close that. Here's the service mesh hub. Um, you should be able to see it. I'll, I'll zoom in on the, some of the salient pieces here. We have an Istio mesh deployed. This happens to be running on GKE. We have Istio deployed here. If I click on Istio, we can see some of the services that, uh, um, that are deployed, deployed inside the mesh. Uh, we can create RBAC rules. And so, so part of what the service mesh hub does is also simplify some of the um, management of a, a single mesh. But what we'll see here is we have the normal out of the box Istio book info demo. But what we're gonna do is we have another team, let's say we acquire another company and uh, they ran everything in AWS and uh, they opted to use Linkerd. Linkerd is, is, is fine. Um, and so what we wanna do is we wanna first of all discover the EKS clusters that they have. And within the cluster, we wanna see, we wanna evaluate what mesh is running in that cluster and then we wanna understand what services are running in that cluster. And then ultimately we would like to unify them so that we can just route transparently from one mesh to the other without uh, you know, the application knowing or caring about it, right? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna click on the configuration tab. We're going to click on clusters. And we see we have our local GKE cluster but what we want to do is register a cluster. We're going to register a Kubernetes cluster, specifically the one, uh, let's see, uh, that one. And basically we're, we're going to give it a, a name of EKS cluster. We'll give it the cube config to be able to connect to the cluster. And we'll click register. And when I click register, we should hopefully see the other cluster pop up and we've automatically introspected the cluster and found that Linkerd is running in, in that cluster. So we've discovered a, uh, a cluster running in a totally different uh, cloud and a totally different cluster. If I click back on meshes here, we can see we have two independent service meshes, one running Istio, one running Linkerd in two different clouds. Now what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create a group. We're gonna group these meshes so that they ultimately for, um, you, you know, they're, they're, able, they're able to just pretend like they're one single mesh. They're not, they're separate, but from the routing capabilities, the policy capability, security and so on, they're gonna appear as though they're just, they're one mesh. So we're gonna click create a group. We'll add these two together. We'll call this, uh, uh, big mesh and click submit. Now that will give us a single mesh group that we can now apply routing rules and, and, and policies to. So, yes. Right. Right. So the ultimate architecture ends up looking like, sorry, yes. <laughs> it was a great question. So Linkerd has built their own custom proxy, built in Rust, using uh, some of the new, new AIO libraries that they have in, in Rust and is not Envoy ultimately, right? 
Uh, Istio, on the other hand, uses Envoy as its proxy. Now the question is, how do we, how do we unify that if they're to totally different technologies? And so the answer is the, 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 um, the architecture ends up looking like this. So I can, I can pop this up a little bit closer. So with, when a service call goes across the boundary, regardless of the mesh, whether it's two Istios or an Istio and a Linkerd or Istio and App Mesh, or whatever, when it crosses these network boundaries, it will go through the edge gateway. Now in our particular use case, in this particular demo, that ingress gateway on the, um, on the EKS side where Linkerd lives is glue. And glue is written in, is, is Envoy, right? Um, and so from there, we could, you know, the traffic will get from the cluster. And, and so the opposite, would opposite direction would happen too, right? If it originates in Linkerd, it would end on a gateway at the, at the Istio mesh. Now in our demo, that is uh, also glue, but, it, but if you don't need API gateway capabilities, you might not need that, right? You could just use Istio ingress gateway. Linkerd doesn't have a gateway, so we use, we use glue. Um, but so the same uh, traffic routing would, would happen going, going back that way. Does that make sense? So, right, we come back here, uh, book info, we refresh, looks good, everything's fine. What we wanna do here is, uh, is create a bridge or create the connectivity. So we've grouped them now. Um, and what we wanna do is explicitly say, these services can communicate with each other across them. And they don't, they don't know that they're across the mesh, but we wanna be kind of specific about which ones can. Uh, we're redoing some of the, these use cases based on feedback, but right now in this demo, that's how it's gonna work. <laughs> um, so what we're gonna say is, this is the, we'll call this the details service bridge. We'll say that uh, the product page from one mesh should be able to talk to the details service from, oh, there's two of them. Maybe there's, I don't know why that's two. <laughs> from, uh, don't mind that. Um, from the, from the, the services running in the remote, the remote uh, mesh. We'll click create the bridge. That looks good. We can see it's a bridge between Istio and Linkerd. Now, when I come into one of the Istio services, and basically when, I, when I'm coming in here and I'm, and I'm trying to um, specify the routing rules, what I'm gonna say is half the traffic should go to the detail service that's running in GKE with Istio, and then half the traffic should go to the detail service that's running in EKS with Linkerd. All right, so if we come over here, we'll find the detail service. And if you're familiar at all with Istio, uh, you can see that the service mesh hub has automatically added the service entry. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about it, but a, service entries is a way you can define external resources for uh, other services. But if we, so service mesh hub has automatically added that. We can add that here. We can say um, it's 100%, but, it, but it, it's weighted. We should see, okay, so we should see 100 and 100. Uh, so it's 50% it's, it's uh, routing because it's based on weights. Now, if we come back here and, and hit refresh, we should see, okay, so that is the details page from uh, EKS. And uh, if we refresh a couple times, we should see 50-50 load balancing. This is the details page from from the Istio running in, in GKE. So that is multi-cluster at its extremely worst case. <laughs> Nothing bad about Linkerd, I'm just saying that uh, you could have two completely different um, service meshes and, and still achieve the, the unification. I'm not gonna talk about this. This is, this is um, we, we're kinda out of time here, but uh, I do wanna put on your radar Somebody asked the question about um, um, change, adding protocols and um, uh, altering the behavior of Envoy at runtime. WebAssembly is a way, a secure way of running injected code into, well, in web browsers that originated in the web browser community, 
uh, for speeding up JavaScript and running it safely. But we can do the same thing now with uh, WebAssembly and injecting that into Envoy Proxy, or at least it, it's coming. It's, it's in um, it's an alpha stage, I would say right now, but, it, but it's coming and it's coming quickly. Be on the lookout for more announcements on that front. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I appreciate the questions and the time you spent. Reach out to me. That's why I put, I've had people come up and say, can I, can I reach out to you? Can I DM you? And I'm like, yeah, that's why I put my <laughs> contact up there. Um, reach out to me if you have questions or follow-up thoughts um, or disagreed or want to buy me a beer, let me know, any of those things. Um, and then here's, here's some uh, uh, links. To, and, and you know what? I'm going to, I'll post these slides onto my slide share. So th these will be available and I'll send them to the organizer to put them on the, on the meetup as well. So again, thank you so much. Hope you have a good evening. <laughs>